Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a man who is outstandingly talented in two different fields, medicine and music. And here he is in person, Stefan Willisch. Thank you very, very much for joining us today here on Talking Germany. You're very welcome. Lovely. Wonderful. Now, uh, Stefan Willisch is both a cardiologist and a conductor, and he's currently taken time off from his post as the head of Berlin's Institute for Social Medicine to work as the director of another highly prestigious Berlin institution, the Hans Eisler Academy of Music. So I think it's pretty obvious, and I, you get, I would imagine you can guess what my first question uh, will be, because there's, people always talk about the, uh, it's a commonplace, the connection between music and mathematics... What is the, the connection between music and medicine? Well, I think there's, there's many interesting aspects there. Both uh, are based on a highly structured system, like uh, music is based on mathematics, medicine is based on natural sciences. But then you need a lot of subjective interpretation of emotion to bring this field alive. So in medicine, you need the doctor-physician relationship Mm -hmm. uh, a very subjective, intense, personal, emotional relationship to make medicine alive and to support healing aspects. And in music, obviously, you need, you need a, a spectacular and emotional interpreter of, of, of that uh, music, uh, a player. So, so there's many similarities. Plus, medicine has profited from music over centuries. So mm. music has had been used in, in hospitals quite specifically in the Middle Ages for specific diseases you would treat with specific music. This is new to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. And, and, well, it has become forgotten because over the development of natural sciences, music has played a, a much lesser role than in hospitals. But now there's a renaissance going on. We sort of rediscover effects of music and think about how can we use them for healing, mm -hmm. healing processes and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's not just all about healing for both of these, uh, the, the, for both music and medicine. It's also about you can make people happy as simply as that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Satisfactory, uh, satisfaction in, in life and, and uh, it's, it's very fulfilling. Many people use it as a... As a uh, yeah, for, for stimulation and, and on whatever level. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, what would you say you are? More a medic, a musician or a manager? Because you've got three hats on all at the same time, oh, really. Yeah. Well, my current job is being a manager. I'm the president of this uh, music conservatory and so my aim and my task and my, my duty is to, to develop that conservatory in the best possible way mm -hmm. and develop it artistically, but also strategically, financially, in order to, uh, also with respect to the awareness of the public and so on. Some very interesting uh, footage there of you in action, of conducting and what have you, but there was also some lovely photos of you as a, as, a, as a young lad, effectively. The one I liked very, very much was the one with you on your bike there, all packed up and ready to go with the straw hat on. <laughs> what, what, what was all that about? I'm very interested in bikes and what have you. So. I, I've done lots of, uh, of bicycle tours when I was, uh, was a teenager. Ah. So I was, I was, for days and weeks, I, w I was out there uh, touring Germany, touring France, Italy, the Alps and so on. I found that uh, pretty exciting and I still like uh, bicycling. I think it's a perfect combination of, of really exper experiencing where you are and, 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 and still um, um, passing certain distances. So. Lovely. A man of my own heart. Uh, to, um, tell me a little bit about your, uh, your musical family. Uh, well, I come from a bourgeois background. Um, my father was an attorney, a patent attorney, my mother a teacher, but uh, there was a lot of uh, music going on. So my mother would take me in, in choruses when I was already a young child and uh, was given the violin in order to start it, as my brothers and sisters also got instruments. So uh, it was clearly a fostering environment, nurturing environment in terms of cultural influences. Mm. I said that, that, that sounds very good when you use the term fostering environment, because often when parents uh, are musicians themselves, uh, they, they, they project their musical ambitions onto their young children and there's, there's pressure involved. That doesn't appear to have been the case. No, no, I don't think there was real pressure. There was clearly expectations, but... Um, yeah, but I think it was a, 
it was a it was a fair balance. So I I didn't really feel pressure. The first couple of years were hard playing the violin, and it's not really that funny. But but when it started to become an orchestra instrument, an ensemble experience, I, I really started enjoying it. And ever since. Uh, music has accompanied me very intensely in life. And you did you did go off and and begin begin to study music in Stuttgart for a year or two. And yeah, there, for, uh, but but then you broke off there and chose medicine. Yeah, I think um, on the one hand I realized that I was not that gifted musician who would make a sky high career and. Facing uh, reality in an average orchestra or so, I think, um, was a rather sober uh, imagination. <laughs> and on the other hand, music, uh, medicine appeared a very exciting and interesting field. And not necessarily a passionate and emotional field, but an interesting field. And so that's why I chose medicine at this point. Mm. It's interesting. I, I have one quote from you where you, see, you say, music seemed too valuable to me to make it a bread and butter job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that... Uh, yeah. um, you, were work, you worked very hard to establish yourself as a, as a top-level medical practitioner. You got master's degrees from the US and France. And while, while you were doing all that, you were still practicing music on a very sort of disciplined and constant level. Yeah, yeah yes. music has always accompanied me. I, I have always been involved in, in chamber um, music, particularly a string quartet, and I've always had some, some uh, projects as a conductor, and I was involved in, in orchestra work. So in my leisure time, my leisure time was always um, uh, yeah, uh, filled with, with a lot of music. Mm -hmm. And in uh, 2007, it was the World Doctors' Orchestra. You, was, you were very much, you were instrumental in the founding of the orchestra. It was your project, really. Tell us a little bit about how it came about. Well, um, uh, originally I had separated medicine from music quite clearly. Uh, medicine was my job, music my passion, but then I, I'm, I have met many, many doctors that had had a, a very intense musical background, so that lived with these two, uh, two uh, um, um, hats. And so I figured, why not, why not combine it? And why not use music as a means to, to express medical responsibility? And that's when I started this World Doctors' Orchestra, when I... Um, ask who would be interested in joining an orchestra with the purpose of um, demonstrating global responsibility, medical responsibility, donating the prestige of our concerts for medical aid projects and ma making people more aware that in many parts of the world, mm -hmm. healthcare is just not good at, at, at all. And how does it work logistically? How, do you do, how, how does somebody get into the orchestra in the yeah. first place? How does somebody get onto your list? And, yeah. uh, and how, do you, you know, how do you rehearse? How do you yeah. bring the yeah. people together? Yeah. Well, getting in is very simple. You just apply on the, on the website of the, of the orchestra and, and then you are a member and get information as to when concerts are and so on. But the surprising part is that there is literally hundreds of doctors now from all over the world, from over 50 countries by now, mm -hmm. that are willing to devote their vacation time and, and uh, that make, organize their own travel, pay for their travel to come together. Now, they all receive sheet music way in ahead and, and they prepare and then a few days, five days before the concert, we meet in the cities where we appear. We mm -hmm. appear in many cities in the world. And then we work uh, very hard, like doctors are used to hard work. That's a <laughs> fairly easy. Yeah. And then we give concerts. Let's just have a look at some footage, which I think we've got of, uh, of uh, a, a concert or concerts that you gave in South Africa not too long ago. Here we go. Just tell us what we're seeing there. Yeah, this was a very special concert. Uh, this was a, a concert session in South Africa. And it was special because in South Africa we have supported um, a medical foundation, the Templeman Foundation, for quite a while. So here you see footage from Elanstone, which is a rural area out of Johannesburg, where uh, Hugo Templeman, who, is, uh, who you can see, could see just now, mm -hmm. has been active now for 20 years. He built up a medical care center, but, and that's the surprising part, he also added dance and choruses like you, you see here. So he also explored the possibility to use art and social projects for medical and healthcare purposes. It was a very exciting experience there for all of us.
It looks absolutely wonderful, like an absolutely wonderful encounter. Uh, music became, or took even more, sort of centre stage in your life when, it, when, it, when a year ago or so you became the head of the Hans Eisler Academy of Music here in Berlin. Mm. How did you get that job? I, I, I can't imagine you simply applied for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, I, I applied for it, but other people had, had hinted that that might be a good combination. And for me, I think it was a, a once-a-lifetime opportunity to... To, to do what I love to do anyway, and to combine my my university experience with with music as a passion. Mm. So it was a surprise for many colleagues of mine, but those who would know me better, and for my friends, it was not that far fetched this mm. this move. And as I said, I'm I think I've I'm blessed, and and it's a it's a great job. It's a fantastic conservatory. And it's an exciting challenge to, to make that move ahead as a, as a president. Let's begin by talking, uh, Stefan Village, about the location of the, of the Music Academy. It's right in the heart of Berlin at the Gendarmenmarkt Square, which some people say is one of the most beautiful squares in Europe. It must be a great place to work in that sense. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. We're on the Gendarmenmarkt and we have a second building right next to the new castle that is ah, rebuilt now. Yeah, yeah. So in the Marstall, mm. so uh, five minutes walk away. So a spectacular location right in the heart of Berlin. Lucky you. And, and the, the whole thing is named for Hans Eisler. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you can explain or give us an idea of who Hans Eisler was, because in Germany, he's, you know, he's quite well known, but in outside Germany, not many people will be familiar with I think with in general, Hans Eisler, Hans Eisler is rather uh, unknown. He's a, an, Austrian, an Austrian composer. He was an Austrian composer who had actually a very exciting, interesting, multifaceted life. He was a pupil of Schoenberg mm -hmm. for his uh, composition studies. Um, he, he was successful in the 20s and 30s and then had to leave because of his uh, communist background. He emigrated to the US. Then he had another interesting stage in his career because he became known in Hollywood as a film composer, movie uh, mm -hmm. composer, did some projects with Charlie Chaplin and so on, before he then again got harassed there again because of his communist background and this of his brother who was a, 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 a clear-cut communist. Mm -hmm. So he came back to, to Europe and to Berlin and became eventually a professor at the conservatory of mm -hmm. Hans Eisler. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, his best known piece is probably the national anthem of the former <laughs> German Democratic Republic that we have heard at Olympic Games so often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, interesting political figure who explored the interface between music and society in mm. quite some, some detail. A really fascinating life. Thank you for plotting it out for us there. Mm. That's great stuff. Uh, it, the question, I suppose, that comes next is uh, the, the, the Academy today was a very prestigious institution in East German times, yeah? Still is. How many continuities have been retained? Because people from the former East Germany tend to say, well, you know, it all got thrown out after the wall came down. The West Germans moved in and took over. Is, yeah. that, is that what happened at the Hans Eisler, or has it been more sort of subtle than that? It was not a drastic turnaround. Music had always been a rather... Uh, protected field, with uh, f from a political perspective, protected field in the East. So uh, it was a rather liberal field compared to, to other sectors. So of course it was a gradual transition, and I think Hans Eisler is a very good, almost prime example for for the for success of re reunification. Mm. I think you still clearly have an, an 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 Eastern influence here, but we have spectacular professors from all over the world, students from all over the world. So we are a truly international institution now, a very successful and high-ranking institution. And at the head of it is you. Are you viewed as an outsider, being the, you know, the coming from the medical profession and coming from outside the academy and taking over at the helm, as it were? Yes, I'm, I'm clearly viewed as an outsider, and that was purposely done so. The traditional way is to elect a professor from your own uh, staff mm. uh, for certain years to become president, but that has pros but also disadvantages. Mm. There's always conflict of interest. So having an outsider, I think, is a, is, is a clear advantage in, in moving ahead the conservatory uh, 
There's important challenges now, budgetary challenges, strategic challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, also, I think our, the focus of our work um, has changed a little bit, as you could hear already in the, in the footage of, of the movie. I think traditionally we want to educate our students to become prominent solos or orchestra members, but that's not necessarily enough nowadays. You also have to, to give them um, more advice with respect to a successful career. We're talking about marketing skills here. Marketing skills, yeah. project skills. Uh, we also talk about the value of music for society and making that more accessible and valuable. So bringing our, uh, our artistic gifts also, in, in, uh, also to societies maybe of, of for example, of, of, uh, of a lower socioeconomic background. Mm -hmm. I think that is very important now and that's what we start to do now. Mm -hmm. And tell me how good the Academy is in international comparison. I mean, people will always look to conservatories in places like, I don't know, New York, Beijing, Warsaw sure, and sure. so on. Where, where, where does Berlin rank? Well, it's hard to generalize because it clearly depends on the instrument. You may have in, in flute and a fantastic star and in, in, in another instrument, not that much. But I think in general, we clearly want to be among the leading schools in Europe. And, and I think we are among the, let's say, 10 leading music conservatories in Europe. That's pretty good going. Yeah. You've, got, you've got very good teaching staff. Just give us a feel for that. Yeah, I mean, we have a, we have a number of, of, uh, of fantastic people that are world-renowned artists and are still very active in terms of their own concert careers. And that, of course, is very helpful to attract also uh, most gifted students from all over the world. Mm -hmm. You've been living in Berlin for quite some time now. Do you view yourself as a Berliner? You weren't born here. <laughs> Well, I was born in southern Germany and then uh, there I spent my youth and then uh, uh, following my studies I was several times, uh, several years I spent in the United States. But 18 years ago I moved to Berlin and Berlin has become my home. I think it's a fascinating place, it's a, it's a lively place, it's, it's of course uh, a city with a, with a long and troubled history mm -hmm. uh, which uh, but also a city of, of extremely rich and diverse cultural life. So, no, I've, uh, it has become my home and I'm not a passionate Berlin lover, but I, I like living here. <laughs> You're being cautious. It's also a city that has an, all, an, an awful lot of building sites. Yeah? That's true. That's true. <laughs> a lot of construction work and that's, uh, yeah. Stefan Vilic, it's been a huge debate here in Berlin for, for many, many years about whether to rebuild the Hohenzollern Palace or not. What's, what's, what's your position on that great debate? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in general, I think I, I love modern architecture and I admire the courage of people and of societies uh, to get involved in modern architecture. In Berlin, I think in general, you have a certain tendency to, to have more of a historic approach. Mm -hmm. So the castle is, is a good example. It could also have um, gone for a brand new modern architecture there. On the other hand, I think it's a great opportunity and being the next door neighbor with our building, our conservatory building, I think we will, we will clearly uh, seek uh, the options to cooperate as early as possible with the, with the evolving cultural life in the, in the castle. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's certainly a very expensive project. It was supposed to cost 590 million euros initially. We're up somewhere now around an estimated 1 billion euros. Let's, before we talk about what they're going to actually do with and inside the building, just tell us a little bit more about this second location for the Hans Eisler Academy that you've mentioned. Tell us about the history of that building. Mm -hmm. The second location is in the what you call Marstall here in Berlin. This is right next door to the castle and it used to be the, the building, it's a big classicist building, the building where all the carriages and all the horses uh, of, of the Prussian kings were. Uh, were. So many, it was the, Many, many horses. <laughs> many horses. It was a huge garage if you want to. <laughs> and it's, it's renovated in a, in a great fashion. It's really exactly as to our needs in terms of practicing areas, but also beautiful concert halls, great offices. So 
it's it's truly a fascinating renovation of this building for our purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've mentioned already one billion euros for the for the new for the new building for the hum Humboldt Forum, as it's mm -hmm. as it's going to be called. Just give us an idea of what is going to what's planned in the Humboldt Forum, from what you know, and what what role you see for the Hans Eisler Academy there. Yeah, well. Uh, I think the planning processes are still ongoing. There's no fixed concept yet, but clearly it will, it will be home for um, certain exhibition, ethnological exhibitions, but also modern library, um, um, modern libraries and so on. And I think our perspective would be to also include music as an aspect here. Or, uh, we also, uh, we are planning for a, for a media library, modern media library in our building. So that is something uh, where we could probably exchange our, our, um, um, our models and, and be attractive for visitors mm. in the castle and in our building. Mm. So plus they, may, they, have, they will have concert halls, so there will be a possibility for performances there where we clearly uh, will, will be involved and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's all interesting stuff, uh, ab absolutely, and something for me to look forward to. But uh, we, we saw in that report about the building site, we saw that uh, it, in recent years, it's been very much a sort of a grassed area where yeah. people have tended to hang out. It's very much what people associate with Berlin being that's very, true. very cool. You must have been, you must have been able to observe all that in recent years oh, from yeah. your premises. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, and I love it. I love uh, free. <laughs> free space, so they could have left it that way for another 10 years or so, from uh -huh. my perspective. Uh -huh. But as I say, there is opportunity there, there's, there's big potential also in the new castle, and over the next couple of years, uh, it, will be, it will be ready to go. Mm -hmm. So a very optimistic take on everything from the, uh, from the cool and the cultured Stefan Village there. Now, mm -hmm. as we've uh, seen, uh, Stefan Village is currently taking time off from his uh, other important post as the head of Berlin's Institute for Social Medicine, Epidemiology and Health Economics, where one of the key focuses is on what they call complementary or alternative medicine. And to give us an idea of what that's all about, let's have a look at uh, homeopathy, which is as popular as it is controversial here in Germany. Similia, similibus, corentor. Like cures like. Samuel Hahnemann was a German physician from Saxony. Over 200 years ago, he created a system of alternative medicine called homeopathy. It was based on the healing principle that that which can produce a set of symptoms can also be used to treat symptoms. Take the humble onion, Allium sepa. It can make your eyes water, but by the same token, it can be prescribed as a treatment for someone who suffers from watery eyes. Based in the town of Kürten in eastern Germany, Hahnemann spent years testing the effects of different substances. To avoid toxic effects, he explored extreme dilutions of the compounds he was testing. He claimed that when they were prepared according to a technique of systematic mixing through vigorous shaking, these dilutions were still effective in alleviating symptoms. From the outset, homeopathy has been controversial. Its detractors believe it is completely ineffective and that remedies are often diluted to the point where they no longer contain any active ingredients. Researchers have spent years on a fruitless quest to prove that homeopathic cures can be effective. So far, there is no scientific evidence to back this belief. That said, a survey of more than 4,000 patients at the Charité Hospital in Berlin revealed that many people said they feel better after taking homeopathic remedies. Over 50% of those questioned said the remedies helped. While some have utmost faith in homeopathy, others dismiss it as humbug. But the fact of the matter is that many patients say it relieves their suffering, and that is what matters. There's a lot to talk about here. Yeah, Richard Dawkins, the, uh, the British uh, scientist and author who's very controversial and almost seeks controversy. He, uh, he, he has called homeopathy the hottest alternative health fad. What's your reaction to that? Well, homeopathy um, 
is a buzzword, is a buzzword where many people feel, have extremely strong feelings mm. for it. Uh, they have fierce opposition and, and fierce supporters. The truth is homeopathy in terms of mechanisms and in terms of scientific basis is unexplored. We have no idea what's really going on and what's supposed to go on. On an effect level, on an observational level, I think it is also obvious for many individuals have profited from that. People where conventional medicine may not have uh, led to the success um, that was hoped for. So, but why it works and how and who would profit most is, is unfortunately totally unknown. From my personal opinion, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I was trained as a normal conventional guy. So from, from my own perspective, it's clearly not this, this little homeopathic medication, this highly diluted medication. However, it is probably more likely this very intense physician-patient uh, um, relationship that is typically, that is very typical for, for the homeopathic uh, therapy setting. Mm -hmm. And that may have a very strong influence. I mean, it's literally hours that is spent in intense uh, exploration and, and communication. So that is time that, that you never have in conventional medicine nowadays. When you talk about conventional medicine, do you understand uh, the, quite why the response to homeopathy, homeopathy has been sometimes so vitriolic, so aggressive? Well, <laughs> because the idea that this highly diluted, medi the, the, that the higher you dilute a medication, the stronger the effect should it's be. It's very paradoxical. Seems <laughs> absurd. And yeah. for every modern, normal scientist, it must be a, it must be a sign of, of uh, uh, yeah. Of, of, it's just not, it it's just doesn't seem reasonable. Mm. Therefore, I, I understand that it's an almost militant uh, debate with respect to the value uh, of, potential value of, of homeopathy. Mm. I find it sad because the, and inadequate, because the, the, the true challenge would be to think, well, how, how can you explain effects? You know, what other factors are important there? Um, as I indicated, the doctor-patient relationship, maybe, maybe, maybe homeopathic could be a good entry to study, to explore that in more detail. Mm. What makes a good doctor? What makes a bad doctor? What, what supports treatment success beyond pure technology and beyond pure medication? Mm. It, certainly, uh, it has its origins. It has its roots in Germany. Is this, a, is this a branch of medicine that is very German? Or is it, what can you tell me about wh where else in the world it has been adopted and is popular? Um, it... Uh, it was developed here by, by a guy named Hahnemann, mm. but it then um, made a, a big career elsewhere in the world. In the UK, it is very, uh, it's very prominent. You have a homeopathic hospital in, in London, which was recently renamed, and you have Prince Charles, who is a big supporter of homeopathy. <laughs> but you have other countries. You have India, where it's very popular. You have the United States. Well, in the United States, you find every, everything with, which sounds exciting and interesting. So. So it has um, supporters all over the world, and that makes it um, fascinating. It's just it's clearly not a German-only phenomenon. Okay, okay. And at, at your uh, Institute for Social Medicine, which is attached to the Charité Hospital here in Berlin, a very prestigious hospital, it says on your website, we believe that a pluralistic approach to treatment is the only way to guarantee that patients receive the best possible therapy. Tell me a little bit more about what that means in concrete terms, the pluralistic approach. Yeah. Well, that's very important. I mean, Traditionally, we have the con conventional medicine that it's being taught in university hospitals, but then we have the what we call alternative medicine or complementary medicine that many private physicians would offer that, and many patients utilize that, whether it's acupuncture or yoga or, or osteopathy or, or you name it. And traditionally, unfortunately, there is very little dialogue going on. So usually patients have the choice, either I go to a conventional doctor or to some alternative practitioner. And I find that very unfortunate because uh, in medicine, maybe for acute disorders, modern medicine may be very good, but for many chronic disorders, the combination may be best. Mm -hmm. 
So our goal in the, at the Charité Hospital and our institute has been for a long time to, to put both fields together and try to find the, the best possible combination for each individual patient. That's what I perceive as, as an important goal for the benefit of the patient. Mm. And I'd like to ask you whether you yourself have ever experienced acupuncture treatment. I have experienced it only two or three times and uh, I have needed it fortunately so I uh, but we explored that and examined that in huge studies and in carefully controlled studies and there it was surprisingly helpful acupuncture for mm. particular for pain treatment treatment of chronic pain uh, but also for certain allergies allergic conditions mm. so I was amazed about the effects observed in these studies. The, the, the reason I'm asking is because I, I am a case in point. I, you know, I had a back strain from, 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 I was out running and then I had a back strain and I went along to my doctor yeah. and he said, would you, would, would you give acupuncture a try? And I, mm. he, I said, well, do you, are you recommending it? And he said, yes. And I had treatment here on my ear and 70% and se the, the of the pain disappeared yeah. In yeah. just a couple of moments, really, it was quite astonishing stuff, and presumably that reflects, uh, you know, the the broader investigation that yeah. you've been undertaking. That's that's mm -hmm. a very typical uh, and remarkable example. That's what you often feel that people that are treated with only conventional methods, pain medication or so, usually don't get that success, and all of a sudden you get some breakthrough. And again, in acupuncture, nobody really knows about the mechanism so far. And this is, of course, a, a fascinating, thrilling cha uh, challenge for the future, how to, how to, um, how to clarify the mechanisms. Mm. We're talking about music and healing. We're talking about the, 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 the benign impact that music can have on body and mind. You are a very busy person, that much is clear, a very disciplined person. When you want to relax, what music do you listen to? Well, I'm a very narrow-minded, <laughs> classical-oriented person. So classical music, I think, is over 90% of the time is what I, what I hear. Within classical music, I'm, uh, I'm rather broad. I mean, there's clearly some, some, uh, some, some very important figures from Bach over Beethoven to Brahms and uh, Bogner and Mahler and so on. That, um, that I'm very attached to. But in general, I'm, I'm very curious and very open-minded to any kind of classical music. No mention of Mozart on the healing effects of music. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the older you get, the more uh, only Mozart will count. That's what colleagues of mine tell me, and I, I can imagine that. So when you're 80, uh -huh. you probably can't stand Mahler and Wagner anymore, but Mozart is still... <laughs> Let's, let's move on to our Talking Germany quiz at the end of the show, yeah? Quick questions, quick answers. When you have a cold, do you personally choose conventional medicine or alternative medicine? Both. I, I like chicken soups and Tom Kha Gai, <laughs> but, I, but if necessary, I take the antibiotics. Okay. What do you prefer, conducting or playing? Conducting. Who are happier, doctors or musicians? Musicians. <laughs> and what is more healing? Our final question, music or medicine? For acute disorders, medicine. For chronic disorders, music plays an important part. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much for those words of wisdom. That is your lot with the very talented, thoughtful and thought-provoking Stefan Village. If you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, then do come back next week. And you might like to check out my blog on the Talking Germany uh, website uh, on the internet there, uh, where you can watch any of the shows that you might have missed. For now, bye-bye and tschüss.